All right. We should be live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Open Space for Monday, June 15th, 2020. Of course, uh, this is our more open concept, uh, free ranging discussion about space and astronomy. Honestly, I have no idea what we're going to talk about. I suspect asteroids. And that's because I'm joined by uh, Dr. Jamie Malaro, who is a planetary scientist. Jamie, welcome to Open Space. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Excited to talk about some rocks. Yeah, yeah, space rocks. <laughs> They're even more exciting. Um, so who are you? What do you do? Um, I am a research scientist at the Planetary Science Institute. I also am affiliated with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I uh, do some work there. And my research focuses primarily on like mechanical like weathering processes. How, how do rocks break down and fracture over time on the surfaces of the moon and asteroids. Um, and I also do some similar work in looking at icy surfaces because in space, ice acts very similarly to rocks in certain environments. Wow. So um, I'm just trying to understand like how these surfaces evolve over time and what kinds of processes are um, contributing to that, you know, sort of evolution and, right. and breakdown and, and how it changes the landscapes that we see with our spacecraft. And so when we think about, say, weathering here on Earth, we're imagining rivers wearing down rock formations, uh, tecton plate tectonics moving co the continents around, all of the wind and weather that is grinding these rocks down. None of that stuff exists out in space. So what does it really mean to have rocks be weathered in a place with no weather? Right. That's a great question. And yes, yeah, so on Earth, we have um, certainly a lot of weathering processes that involve water rain, you know, chemical processes that can cause changes in these rocks and even cause, you know, fractures to form. There's also biogenic processes that are, you know, assisted by microorganisms or even, you know, like larger animals and things yeah. like that. Um, yeah. And we don't have any of that yeah. on an asteroid surface. Um, but it turns out that the sun is also weathered. You know, for a long time, we thought that a place like the moon um, or the place like an asteroid that, you know, doesn't have an atmosphere, doesn't have rain. Um, we didn't really think that there would be that much happening there. Um, but it turns out other than impacts, we of course know that impact processes affect these surfaces very right. dramatically. Um, but it does turn out that, um, when you put a bunch of rocks in the sun for a long time, that they also experience changes. Um, and it has had been hypothesized to be important on these bodies for quite a while, but we actually haven't been able to observe it acting on the surface of an airless body like an asteroid um, until recently, which is super exciting that we can really finally study this process up close. Um, and there was some, uh, some interesting pictures that came out uh, last week I think as part of the American Astronomical Society's summer meeting where they were showing some fresh pictures of cracked rocks on the surface of, of Bennu. So is that the kind of process that we're looking at? And is that, was that fairly recent? Yeah. So, um, the specific process that I've been studying on Bennu is, um, it's kind of a set of processes we call, I call it thermal fracturing. Um, and the idea is that, um, you have, rocks sitting out in the sun and they're they're heating and cooling each day and each night and they're going through this sort of cyclic process of heating and cooling and, and slowly over time that could cause um, cracks to develop um, which can cause a variety of different kinds of features to form you know it could cause um, cracking at the boulder surface that could cause small small bits of material to break off but it can also cause like larger fractures to develop that might like split a boulder in half. And that's what the pictures really look like. Yeah. They just really look like like someone had. And it, it, I mean, we see that kind of feature happen here on Earth all the time. You'll see especially places that are colder that get ice forming in the wintertime. You'll see these rocks where it's just been there's just like a great big crack and it's just been cracked open. And right. you know that ice just working like a you know, like a jackhammer, like a, like a, um, I'm trying to think, but like a hydraulic press, just cracking open the rock. Mm -hmm. And, and these pictures, when you saw these pictures from Bennu, um, it's, it's so similar. It's kind of amazing. 
Yeah, yeah, they're quite dramatic looking features for sure. And especially, and like, you know, these, these rocks are so big, some of them. You know, like on earth, we have mountains and then we have smaller boulders and other things. But, you know, on Bennu, it's just a pile of boulders of different sizes. Um, and yeah, you see some of these, these rocks that are, you know, 30 feet across, just like split down the middle. Yeah. Um, and, and they're very cool to see. And so a, a fracture like that, you know, we have to try and learn um, through a variety of, of ways, you know, using spacecraft data, images, also computer modeling and other kinds of things uh, to try and distinguish like which of these features that we're seeing on the surface, are they caused by thermal fracturing? Are they caused by impacts? Are they caused by other, some other kind of process? You know, um, and that's a difficult thing to untangle. Um, Thankfully, with in the case of, of Bennu, we have such high resolution images that it makes it much easier to study the kind of thing you know that I look at. Um, now, now when you talk about the day night cycle, I mean some of these objects are actually rotating quite rapidly, right? So their day nights are actually not that long. Like how long is right. a day on Bennu? Uh, it's about four and a half hours. -ish. Right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the surfaces of the boulder are the part that's most affected by the diurnal cycle, um, you know, upper several inches, tens of centimeters um, near the surface of the boulder. That's the part that's mostly going to be heated and cool um, throughout this cycle. But because it's mechanically connected to the rest of the rock, it does actually cause these stress fields to develop in, in other parts of the rock as well, even deeper down where the heat can't penetrate. Right. Um, there's also an additional factor on asteroids um, that we have that is different than on a place like the moon, which is that there's a there's an annual cycle because Bennu's orbit is uh, elliptical. Mm. And so, you know, when it is closest to the sun, it's getting more heat versus where it's farther farther away from the sun, it's getting less heat. And so that cycle, that yearly cycle, um, also causes temperature changes that penetrate down deeper into the material. So that annual cycle may be um, better able to uh, like cause changes in or fractures to develop in like really large boulders. Whereas the diurnal cycle mostly is gonna affect the smaller Right. Uh, one of the big surprises I know, uh, and of course, our friends at CosmoQuest are quite familiar with this, just how many rocks there are on the surface of, of Bennu and how difficult it was to find a landing site. So is the boulder strewn surface of Bennu a result of this process of this, this space weathering? Or is it, do you think it's some other process that just made it so... Such yeah, a mess. I mean, that's a good question. It is certainly a mess. And I remember when we first were getting the high, like the high resolution images were first starting to come down, everybody kind of looking at them and me being really excited because I'm really excited to look at rocks. But the people who had to pick the landing site were like, or the, you know, the sample collection site were a lot less excited. because <laughs> They knew it was going to be really difficult. Um, but that's a good question. And I think it's, I think it's both. We call, uh, Bennu is what we call a rubble pile asteroid, um, which means, you know, unlike a, a large asteroid, something like Ceres or Vesta that has more of like a cohesive shape, a rubble pile is like kind of just a pile of rocks that is loosely gravitationally held together, um, you know, formed by a collision of bigger things that broke up into a bunch of little pieces and then you're left with a pile of junk. Um, and so, in that sense, you know, it kind of started out as a lot of rocks. Um, however, since that occurred, you know, it has had a long history, you know, for for additional surface changes to occur. And so we think that that thermal fracturing is causing breakdown of boulders on the surface, and it's causing, you know, disaggregation of surface material and kind of chunks to fall off here and there. Um, but you know, it's since it started out as a, as a pile of rocks, uh, the amount of like dust that it can produce is still limited um, 
you know, it, it's not like the moon, yeah. which is, is mostly just dust. Well, and that um, was my next question is when you look at the surface of the moon and you think about the primary weathering, weather, weathering that's going on on the moon, it's the micrometeorite impacts and the, and the, the dust that's being thrown around everywhere. We don't see that, that same thing. We just see meters and meters of, of this regolith across everything. And yet when yeah. we look at Bennu, we see these little pebbles and boulders and, and stuff. We don't see that, that pounded regolith in the same way that we see it on the moon. So does that tell yeah. us something different about their story? Yeah, I mean, I think for one, the moon is a lot larger, it has more gravity, and so it has it it experiences a lot more impacts than something like a small asteroid would. So in that sense, there's a lot more on the moon to kind of pound the surface into dust. Um, on Bennu, um, I think there's there's a question of whether um, First of all, we don't know how long it's been in the inner solar system. It used to be out in the asteroid belt and it has migrated inward since then. Um, if that occurred a really long time ago, perhaps we might expect there to be more dust on the surface from you know, fracturing and other processes. But if it had a younger surface age, then there wouldn't have been a whole ton of time to build that up. Right. Um, there's other factors like um, there's a process, and I don't study this, but there's a process called electrostatic levitation, mm -hmm. which can actually cause dust particles to levitate and be removed from the surface. Right, right. So in that sense, there may be processes, um, you know, that, that are removing material. Even when an impact hits the surface, you know, a small impact, um, it has such a small amount of gravity that it's easy for the rocks to just leave. <laughs> right, they're going to go you know? to orbit around the sun. They're not going to to fall back down to the surface of of right. the of the asteroid. So, I mean, we're not going to know the full story of Bennu until that until that sample comes home. But right now, what do you sort of imagine is the history of Bennu? If you could sort of start back at the beginning of the solar system and and play the film forward to get us to the jumbled rock pile that we see today. What do we think happened at, at sort of various times? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the initial collision that's that created Bennu, um, you know, would have happened, you know, like I said, out in in the asteroid belt in the main belt. Um, then sometime later, um, there's there's this heating effect that occurs that uh, called the, the Yorp effect yeah. or the Yarkovsky effect that can cause the asteroids, um, their migrate, their orbit to migrate inward. And so slowly a little bit, you know, at a time over time, Bennu has been moving in closer to the inner solar system. And that would have kicked off some changes in the way that it was being modified. Like a, a process like thermal fracturing um, wouldn't be effective out in the main belt where it's much colder. But once you get around to near Earth space where it's much warmer, then we're starting to see like, you know, all of these new processes, you know, that weren't happening in the asteroid belt. So these mm -hmm. new processes are now starting, you know, they get kicked off when it migrates inward. And so we're now seeing this sort of fracturing and breakdown of the surface. We're observing um, particles actively being ejected from the asteroid surface. Right, and this is your latest research, right, is this idea that, I mean, we know that, we've talked about this before, that when OSIRIS-REx was approaching Bennu, it sort of flew through a storm of, of particles. It, it sort of like, I guess, bugs hitting the, the windshield, and and that was a surprise that it was that active in the in the area around, and now you think you think you have an answer. Yeah, I mean, certainly there are times when um, impacts from, you know, we have, we, we, the asteroid, have impacted, um, you know, particles that are, that are already in space. Um, we have also observed um, that there are particles being actually just sourced from the actual surface of, of the asteroid. We started seeing these when we kind of arrived in um, January of, of last year. And um, we were we were right at perihelion, which is the asteroid's closest approach to the sun. So that was the time when the asteroid surface was warmest, and we started being able to observe all of these particles just being shot off the surface at various different points. And and sometimes it will only be like a few, like ten particles. Um, but some of the larger events have been hundreds of particles. 
um, you know, like little pebbles, like mm -hmm, gravel mm -hmm. type size material. Um, so since we started observing them, we've been trying to figure out what is causing them. And, um, you know, one candidate is something like impacts. You know, if, if there's an impact from a micrometeorite or something, and, and we do see evidence that this should occur, then that could kick off particles from the surface. Right. Um, in my case, for the thermal fracturing, we're seeing observations of the boulder surfaces uh, exfoliating, is what we call it. It's like a, like a flaking off mm -hmm. of like thin like layers or shells of material. And um, it turns out when we ran the models and you know did the numbers that uh, we think that this exfoliation process does have enough energy to actually eject a particle wow. from the surface. Yeah, so you get this kind of cracking, this crack formed, and then when it disaggregates from the rock surface, it just kind of like boop, bounces off. And I've seen that as well, like again here on Earth, where you'll have like some kind of rock, usually like a, like a granite or something that that the top layer of it has kind of cracked up and popped off. And in this case, it's water or it's lichen is snuck underneath or or something. You got like sort of shards of the rock is is flaking away from the top here on earth it just sits there or it falls to the side of the ground right but with the gravity being so low on Bennu it's just it's it's moving with enough motion that it can go into orbit around the yeah around this asteroid yeah and so there are some there are also some really cool um, videos that some um, geology researchers were able to catch a, capture in the Sierra Nevada mountains here in California of of um, exfoliation. This is like large scale exfoliation of like granite surfaces um, kind of high up in the mountains. And they actually are able to see like that process can like kind of bounce pebbles off the surface. But of course that like what they're observing was like a big landscape scale process. So there's a lot of energy involved in that. Right. Um, but what we see on Bennu is probably analogous, but there's a lot less energy involved. But it just turns out that if you're in a microgravity environment, like you just don't need right. a whole lot to actually get pushed off the surface. And just to give an example, like what is the gravity on the surface of Bennu? Like how, what is the, do you know what the escape velocity is? Oh, I don't have a number yeah. off the top like, of my head. Like could you it's, jump it's, off of Bennu though and, and just be gone? Oh yeah, yeah. easily. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we call it, it's microgravity, you know, yeah. it's orders of magnitude smaller than what we have on Earth. And that's what, <laughs> That's part of what makes like going into orbit around a small object, you know, is difficult for that reason. Um, collecting a sample from, you know, an object with low gravity is also difficult. Uh, yeah. So. And so then uh, I've got a question from Brian Yuku. Were the cracked rocks also observed on Ryugu, which is, of course, the mission of the, the asteroid that was visited by the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission? So have you had a chance to see similar fractures there? Yeah, so um, great question, because in a lot of ways, Bennu and Ryugu are very similar. Um, in some ways, they're they're not. So um, I have not been able to see in in too much detail all of the images that the Hayabusa 2 team has collected, although we do right. collaborate with them some. But of the images I've seen, um, there are certain kinds of boulders that tend to have uh, similar characteristics. Like some of the boulders have this really like crumbly kind of appearance, like like they're just kind of like crumbling into bits and breaking apart. Um, and we see those on, on both surfaces. Um, it, it turns out that Bennu uh, has a little bit more diverse of a population of the kinds of rocks that it has. And so it is more common on Bennu um, than it is on Ryugu to see some of the larger scale fractures like the big dramatic fractures that we're seeing they do they, they we you can see them on Ryugu but they're not as common um, whereas on Bennu we have a lot of these like really blocky angular um, you know really strong rocks that develop these large scale sort of dramatic looking fractures um, so it has been really interesting to start to look at kind of how we think the surfaces on um, the two different surfaces mm -hmm. are evolving differently yeah um, so we've got another question from uh, Jiro the Hero, or Jiro the Hero. Is studying Bennu giving insight on how to approach deflecting asteroids that are potential threats to Earth? I'm sure you've had various versions of this question all the time. And, and I mean, 
if we want to learn how to protect the earth thanks to watching the movie Armageddon, you round up a bunch of deep core driller, oil drillers and send them off with nuclear weapons to try and uh, blow them up on the Texas side asteroid. Uh, I'm assuming now you have notes. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. It's, there are so many asteroids in the solar system and so many different kinds of asteroids and in so many different locations that when we think about the question of like, how do we protect Earth from, from mm -hmm. an impact? It's difficult to, to answer that because there are so many different kinds, you know? And so certainly being able to finally study some of them up close as we send missions to them helps a lot. Like, for example, we know very little about what the interior structure of uh, an asteroid like Bennu is like. So, but now that we're there, we're able to study like, what is its gravity field like? How massive is it? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if we want to take an approach like trying to blow a piece of it off to kind of give it a little kick and change its orbit, then we might do that on, on one type of asteroid, but not on a different type of asteroid where a, a different solution may be more appropriate. Right. Even studying the, like the, the thermal properties, the properties of um, like Bennu, for example, has its boulders seem to be like extremely porous and weak. And that changes uh, how quickly they heat and cool. Um, and so that also changes how quickly its orbit migrates. Um, and so something like that might not help if if it's already headed straight for Earth, <laughs> yeah. but learn, but learning about learning more about those types of properties of the asteroids can help us uh, better model how all of their orbits are going right. to change and better predict if there's ones that we need to actually be concerned about. And I guess I mean. If, if there's anything now with the work that's been done with the different asteroids that have been observed, even with the comets and stuff, we're learning more. I mean, Ryugu and uh, Bennu are kind of similar rubble piles, different from what Eris looked like, different from what, we, you know, we're probably going to expect, um, you know, metal asteroids are going to look like and whether they're farther from the sun, whether they're closer, you know, if they're coming in from the outer solar system and coming towards the earth, different from one that's maybe orbiting very closely to the earth on a regular basis. And, and I think if anything, I guess it's helping us appreciate the complexity of the process that, that, that a different approach might be best for, for a different asteroid. Yeah. So if, for sure. so, 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 if Ryugu or uh, you know if Bennu, so if Bennu is the is the trouble is the problem asteroid, would you have any recommendations on how to specifically stop Bennu from smashing into the Earth? Which it can't, but let's say that it could. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. You know, there's a variety of different solutions out there, but usually the best solutions involve some kind of um, passing on some kind of very small change in its energy so that its orbit changes over long time periods. You know, we're not going to go like just blow the whole thing to bits all at once and like obliterate it. We're just going to give it a nudge. And if you give it a nudge early enough in yeah. its history and you give it the nudge in the right direction, then you could kind of cause its orbit to change over long time scales. Yeah. And so, you know, for that reason, it's, it's certainly not, dramatic like in the movies in any way it's it's it seems so much more mundane than that but that's really the kind of thing that that we need to be prepared to do when we do find candidates that we are afraid are dangerous you know but it, but it seems like benny was already the result of somebody trying to blow up an asteroid <laughs> right like like if you took a solid asteroid and you blew it up then this is what you get which is an asteroid reconfigured into a pile of rubble so, yeah, I mean, to, or two or two asteroids could have smashed together to create it. You know, who right, knows? Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, and, and so it, it just it feels to me like like obviously if you try to just blow like if you fire your nuclear weapon or you you dig down and you put your nuclear weapon in Bennu and you detonate it, it's just going to come out and then it's just going to come back together in roughly the same shape. And, you know, right. now it's now it's angry. Yeah, and I mean, if you do that, some of the material may leave. But yeah, I mean, you're right. Certainly, that some of it will sort of recondense into into a pile. 
And um, there's also a matter of like control. If you were to do that close to the earth, mm -hmm. then all the material that doesn't reform into a rubble pile, like could just get like sent towards earth, which, you know, if they're small enough, isn't a problem. But if you get a larger chunk that accidentally hits earth, then that could still cause damage and, you know, and be dangerous. So yeah. if you do it, if you, if you try and do this, like the slow mundane way you have, we have the ability to have more control in some senses over what's happening. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, now that you've had, I mean, we're still waiting for the samples to come back to help confirm a lot of the theories. Uh, but now that you've had it, you know, we're halfway through this mission. We've got the Hayabusa mission. It's been quite successful. It is on, on its way home as well. You know, there's the Lucy mission, which is getting ready to go out to the to the Trojan asteroids, what are the next big outstanding questions that you have now on asteroids that you think may require a different kind of mission to answer? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to know about them. I mean, as I was saying before, the really the variety um, in like the, the structure and the composition and the properties of asteroids that we have in the solar system is is enormous it's it's a way more diverse population than um than the planets that we have in a lot of ways just just by sheer numbers um but we've only been to a few mm -hmm. and so really um uh, for me i think what is going to be most interesting is to start visiting as many different kinds as we can reasonably get to you know go to really big ones also go to really small ones go to asteroids that are made of stony materials, go to asteroids that are made of metal, asteroids that are made of, you know, carbonaceous materials like Bennu. Um, we really need to kind of fill in our, a map of our understanding, if you will, about what each of these different kinds of surfaces or, or bodies are like in order to get a better sense of like overall, what mm -hmm. is the asteroid population like it because is interesting. all we can see is like squiggles of light you know right 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 <laughs> and so i mean uh, you know when we talk think about the way science fiction has kind of ruined us i think they they use a whole bunch of asteroids that are all roughly the same they use the same material they paint them all they make them in different shapes but they paint them all with the same stuff in right. their computers and then they set them spinning at unreasonably close for for reality and so you would expect that they would all sort of look the same, but, but they're not, they're, right. they're, they're dramatically different objects, depending on their distance from the sun, their orbit, where they formed, what they're made out of their size, right. et cetera. Yeah. And the fact that they're different also means that like, for me, the kinds of processes that I study, like, like rock breakdown processes, those are going to, those processes are going to behave differently on different objects that have different characteristics. Uh, or they're made of different things. Um, and so, you know, while that, while OSIRIS-REx is only a mission to one asteroid it specifically, by being able to study up close the way that this process operates, it also does help us to learn what the process is like on other bodies. Because mm -hmm. if, if we can study it and we can kind of validate it and figure out, like, we feel like we know how it works on one body, we can say, well, okay, but what if it was made of this kind of rock instead? Mm -hmm. What would happen? And, you know, so it may be that on some surfaces, the process is efficient and it causes cracks to form and the development of rocky surfaces and, you know, all that. And it may be uh, on a different object that it's not very efficient. And so that surface is going to look different, um, you know, than, than Bennu's surface. And that does influence things like, how we see light reflected from it or yeah. if we wanted to prepare to go land on it for example we need to know what its surface we'd like to know what its surface is like so that we can prepare for how we're going to land um, and and as it relates to landings i mean so far the work has been very tentative i'm actually kind of surprised that we d ha there hasn't been a more um, ambitious attempt to land and crawl around on the surface of, of an asteroid. I know Hayabusa had threw all kinds of machinery at Ryugu, which bounced and jumped and flipped around and, and it extracted a, a sample. There was the, uh, the Rosetta mission, its attempt to try and land 
and which failed on the Comet 67P. Um, uh, the near mission, I think, landed, you know, it lithobraked onto the surface of, of Eros. Right. Uh, but there really hasn't been a curiosity style rover that's been roaming around the surface of an asteroid, picking up samples, seeing what they're made of, and then moving on and looking at other things. Is this in the works? Is it fundamentally a difficult problem, do you think? Um, it is difficult in the sense that um, as a low gravity surface, landing on it is more dangerous to attempt than trying to orbit it. Because if you bounce yourself off the asteroid, then you know you may end up moving away from it instead of landing on it. Um, and if we don't know what the surface is like ahead of time, if we haven't been there and we, we show up thinking, oh, it's going to be smooth and we'll be able to drive around on it really easily. And, but then it looks like Bennu instead, yeah. then, you know, we would be in trouble. Um, but I think also, and, and this is interesting because I, I would like to see that kind of mission eventually. Yeah. But I also think that a landed mission fundamentally is, is targeting different science questions than, um, an orbiter mission, because there's, a, there's some science you can't do as well from the ground, you know, from orbit, you can take pictures of what the thermal emission from the surface is, mm -hmm. you know, all around the surface, you can look at the composition of the whole surface, um, you get this sort of, uh, figuratively speaking, this global picture of what the object is like, you can get information on its gravity field and and things like that. But if you land on the surface, you're limited to the area directly around the asteroid or directly around the lander. Um, so you have the advantage in that case of being able to really see up close what the surface is like with yeah. images and other instruments. You can also um, try and do things like uh, put instruments underground to measure like the heat flux in the interior and things like that. Um, but ultimately, I, I think that those questions are just different. And at the stage where we are right now with like sort of the state of our knowledge of asteroids, um, the orbiter missions really give us a lot more context to work with right now. Right, um, right. So I think the kind of mission, a landed mission is, is sort of a, I think a more future, it's a concept that I think will happen, but maybe in our future once we've had a, a chance to visit more. Uh, so I mean, I know that back in the mid 2000s, the original plan for the, uh, you know, for the the space launch system and the, even potentially the deep space gateway was to set up a way for humanity to go out and, and send maybe a human mission to asteroids. Do you think that human beings are an appropriate um you know, that's an appropriate target for humans to go to, to explore asteroids. Does it, does it make sense as a place for humans to go to? Um, I mean, people who are really invested in and excited about human space exploration will often point out, and it's true that, um, you know, if, if you put a geologist on the ground, you can, you can learn things about the surface, um, much more efficiently mm -hmm. in certain ways than, by looking at a bunch of pictures of it, because the data you can collect from a spacecraft is limited and there's weird lighting angles. And sometimes you just wish like, I wish I could just walk up to that rock because I think it's like this, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, we can learn just as much from, you know, sending a human to an asteroid as we could sending a human to the moon or any other, you know, um, terrestrial target, you know, rocky surface, a target with a surface. Um, that being said, um, personally, I think that, uh, especially in the context of asteroids, because there's so many that I would really like to visit, yeah. that robotic missions are more cost efficient and they can be done, um, they can be developed more quickly. And in some ways, like the, really the amount of data that you collect with a spacecraft versus with a person is is much greater and so there's a lot more right. to kind of dig through slowly over time um to to kind of really dig into the science and learn about the object right so but, personally but, that's what i favor yeah but i mean i guess like if if the assumption is that the humans are going to space and they've got to go so like the point is not that the humans are going to do science that is the bonus 
the point is that the humans are going to go to space and they're going to learn to live in space and they're going to learn to 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 perform some kind of activity in space because it is is a stepping stone to the next thing that humans are going to learn to do in space. Do asteroids make sense? I mean, are they or like, would you rather see the astronauts going to the moon? Would you rather see them going to the asteroid of your choice? Or, or are you fine with them heading off to Mars? Like you don't really care. It's not you'd rather you'd rather have a spacecraft. I mean, if someone says, would you like some <coughs> asteroids? Sorry, would you like some astronauts? Uh, would you like a mission to one of your space rocks? Would you be would you be OK with that? I mean, I would or be is it too okay dangerous, with it, you know, like, but it... it's I, I think there's in terms of the different goals that people may have for putting humans in space um, right now, where we are with our sort of understanding of how to operate in space, uh, going to some place like the moon, I think, makes a lot more sense than going to uh, an asteroid. Um, Personally, I also just think that if you're not putting humans in space to do science, there's no reason to put humans in space. You know, yeah. I, I'm not super interested in that sort of the narrative of, well, we can learn to live in space, therefore we should. And that has to be, you know, humanity's future. I think that uh, I, I don't think we necessarily need that. And I, I think that for me and for humanity, you know, science and, and learning really is is ultimately my goal and and given we have limited funds mm -hmm. you know on a practical side given that we have limited we as sort of nasa and the science community we have limited funds to explore the solar system and so you know we can do a lot more with robotic spacecrafts than we can you know with humans in terms of cost yeah i mean i think that that I always, I always sort of think that it's a false dichotomy when people say, "Well, we could, we've got a limited number of budget, we've got th you know," and that they that planetary exploration, robotic planetary exploration, and science is a, it has to pull budget or from from crude exploration is you know and the two are pulling budget from each other and I and I think they're two completely different goals, right? It's like asking about. NASA working on airplanes, but also NASA working on field geology on the mountains, you know, on, on Mauna Kea. And they're two separate, there's two separate things. And so I think, yeah, with, that's fair. You yeah. know, one is a transportation survival thing and the other is a science outcome. And for sure, I think that when you, when you look at like, how can we just get the most amount of scientific knowledge from, from space, most of the time it's a it's a you know it's a it's a robotic mission okay. um but but at the end of the day there's only one way to answer the question how can we make human beings survive in space and that's to send them to space and watch how they die right, right. or no <laughs> i just don't know why anyone would want to do that i don't i don't know either um <laughs> but but i do know that well no i mean i think that that there is a fascination and there is you know there are lots of i think great reasons to to go to space. I just think that you don't need to justify it with, well, it's a good because we can get them to do science, right? Robots can do science, right? Like, don't, that's not your reason. Your reason is because you want people in space. And so just like, if that's what you want, then make people, you know, have people go to space and figure out how to keep them alive. And that's important. Um, so anyway, I think, so do you think the asteroid sort of it's it's a lot of tiny missions like is it CubeSats? Would you prefer a, a bunch of small missions, each one doing a mediocre job of studying asteroids than one flagship? Ooh, that's a good trade space as the term we like. to Yeah, use. a trade space. Well, yeah, I mean, you have to think about if you if, if you have one flagship, you're getting a lot of instruments, you're going to get a ton of data, but yeah, only about one target. And the trade-off, you know, if you go the other route, yeah, we get to learn about more targets. So, I mean, in in a parallel universe where we have infinite budget, then like we go to all of them, right? But um, with the flagship, yeah, <laughs> one flagship to all ten thousand. To every asteroid, asteroid yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I mean, I I think I think there's certain kinds of science that can that certainly can be done with something like cubesats or very small uh, spacecrafts, um, something like. Uh, Osiris Rex is a really nice size because you really get uh, 
really the depth of information that we're that we're getting about the asteroid is is fantastic. So like I would like to see um, you know some more missions here and there like Osiris Rex that are doing in-depth studies of individual targets. Um, but if we add to that sort of sprinkling in smaller, less capable, cheaper spacecrafts that can go do you know, just a handful of observations at a bunch of different ones, then that would really kind of help us fill in the gaps of what we understand mm -hmm. about the asteroid population. So, yeah. um, so personally, I think the sort of the, the, the complementary approach there uh, is ideal. Um, one of the sort of the issues with, with trying to be able to have like with say OSIRIS-REx, I mean, imagine if it, instead of it just flying out to one asteroid and being able to fly and then take a sample and then fly home and deliver the sample like a good robot, wouldn't it be amazing if it could visit multiple destinations over the course of a, of a longer mission? But the issue is propellant. So the idea that is now coming up more and more often is, is this idea of in situ resource utilization about using living off the land, uh, letting your robot live off the land. So do you think that there are the resources available in some of these asteroids that that, for example, uh, OSIRIS-REx or some future version of it could refuel from the asteroid and be able to move on, you know, and restock its propellant and go somewhere else? Uh, I volatiles? don't know. Um, some asteroids do have volatiles, like various kinds of ices, uh, commonly water ice, but there may be some that have other kinds of ices as well. Um, but if you send a spacecraft there that, without there being sort of a, a fuel station, if you will, then you have to build a spacecraft that can essentially mine and convert that ice into a fuel by itself, which is just going to make the spacecraft more expensive to develop and heavier, mm -hmm. which, you know, is going to make it harder to launch from the surface and all of this stuff. And what if you just included more propellant when you sent it out in the first place? Um, I'm certainly not an expert on these types of technologies. So my intuition says that I don't really see that as being feasible and in, in sort of an autonomous sense. But do you think that the, that the raw material, I mean, I think that the traditional idea of an asteroid is that it's just this dry, dead pile of rock. And it really seems like they're more dynamic than we expect and possibly do have more water ice and volatiles under the surface. So do, so do you think that they have more, uh, that they are more valuable or more, there is more there than we think? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the asteroid in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, like Bennu, for example, does have water on the surface, but it's not in the form of ice like the way that we think about it. It's that its minerals are like these kind of clay-like minerals, and there's water kind of bound up inside the minerals in between the, the sort of structural layers of the, of the clay molecules. And like that water could be freed, um, and perhaps used from the rock, but it would take a lot of energy to get it out. So there's kind of like an energy conversion problem there. Other asteroids that have more sort of um, like regular ice deposits kind of thing um, would be, I think, much easier to target for that type of application. You know, and the more we learn about asteroids, the more it also is unclear, like, what is the difference between an asteroid and a comet? Yeah, And yeah. there's like, there's a lot of objects out there that like, we don't know exactly how much water they have, but they have some. And, you know, so figuring out how to use it, you know, maybe, you know, may be feasible at some point in the future, but it's always an energy problem. How much energy does it take to get it out of the material and convert it to something you can use? And is that more or less than right. the amount you're going to get from it? Um, yeah, and it and it almost is like the, it all depends on where we are on the technology stack. Does it make more sense to send a follow-on tanker that can that can dock with it later on and and fill it back up with more propellant and then have the mission go off on its own, or does it make sense instead of sending a tanker just to send two identical robots to two different targets and and have them do their do their job? I'm sure the right. the the cost benefit just goes on forever. And as new techniques are developed, then suddenly the, the variables change and suddenly new ideas make more sense. There was this great idea 
um, from a, there's a Finnish researcher who's working on this idea of an electric sail. I don't know if you've seen this idea. And so he was proposing that you, no. you send thousands of these, of these little CubeSats or, you know, hundreds maybe. And each one uses one of these electric sails that are, that are driven by the sun's solar wind, the charged particles coming from the solar wind. And so each one of these, if you could change its trajectory enough to maybe visit 10 asteroids in the in the asteroid belt do this big long looping orbit and then make their way back to earth and then dump all their data and you could get this really you know you could visit 10,000 different objects or you know thousands of different objects all at the same time in a very cursory way and go let's go back to this one or that one or this one right mm -hmm. so I, I, it's like, do you want to get the information like really in depth or do you want to get some like a very cursory high level and then come back, follow on with more detailed observations? I mean, yeah, have... I mean, and in that sense, like it's it's certainly easier to visit a place and study it in depth if you have any information about it ahead of time. Yeah. And yeah. so doing that sort of cursory visit where you send one buzzing by a whole bunch of different ones to snap a few pictures and um, that, that helps a lot when you're developing a mission later to go back and, and study it or, or sample it and, you know, yeah. things like that. Um, so this question comes from Gordon Chin. Do you, you think that we won't get more energy from mining an asteroid than the act of mining it? So, you know, we haven't talked about this yet. So let's talk about, let's talk about asteroid mining. Um, pro or con? Personally con, yeah. um, for two reasons. One is, um, we may have a lot of asteroids, but honestly, I'm a conservationist. These are, you know, they're like national parks to me. Like we might want to visit and see it and study it, but I don't want to destroy it. Right. Um, and that opinions on that vary in the community and, and in society, of course, mm -hmm. um, at least with asteroids, we have a whole ton of them. And so, you know, there's that, but on the other side, um, you know, I don't know much about the sort of the specific technology involved with actually the act of actual mining, but it's not like on Earth, like Earth has like veins of metals, for example, where you can find sort of a concentration of a mineral or a metal or whatever it is you're mining all in, in kind of one place. And in some ways that makes it easier to uh, extract and to process, but like asteroids, they just have a bunch of, they have a bunch of minerals that we might want, but they're all kind of broken up and scattered, mm -hmm. you know, just within the mineral structure of the rock. Um, so there's nowhere to go and we can't go there and be like, well, specifically dig here and we'll find a, a deposit of this material. Like asteroids aren't going to be like that. Um, so that would presumably then involve some sort of like like crushing of the material right. and maybe chemical processes that are used to kind of separate out components and the kind of machinery uh, that you would need to do that. Like, I don't know, to me it seems like big and expensive, right. any kind of chemical processing, like may also, you may also need like liquids or other kinds of things that you're carrying with right. you that then you need to replenish. Um, yeah. So it sounds to me like an extremely costly, uh, endeavor just to send, yeah. you know, a small amount of material back to earth. Well, I mean, I, I, th I, I think the... I've seen it as profitable in any way. Yeah. And, and I mean, we see company after company go out of business. So it's very clear that the asteroid mining business is fraught with, uh, with risk and, and really, I mean, I don't think anyone's ever been able to make a case that, that it ever makes sense to, mine from an asteroid when you can just pick up the exact same things here on earth as you say in veins of of metal but you know from a con con uh, conservation standpoint i mean it would be nice to keep them as pristine wilderness but at the same time we are not respecting the earth as what could be a pristine wilderness and so with the you know if we are going to continue to build smartphones and um, other cars, smart, you know, whatever, as low impact cars as we can and, and such, we're still going to be, uh, consuming the environment that we live in. And so I think as, at some point we do have to just sort of decide which is the one that we are going to extract our resources from, and which is the one that we're going to protect. 
Sure. And I mean, if it were a case where we could stop mining material on Earth mm -hmm. and only get it from space, then I think that's a great that could be a great potential, yeah. you know, solution to a lot of like problems we have with you know, resource distribution and utilization, climate change, all those kinds of things. Um, but it's not clear to me that the amount of resources that we consume on Earth, uh, or even specifically all of the different types of resources we consume on Earth would be available in a way that was feasible to yeah. get from space. Yeah. Um, and I mean, and there, I think the, the, for the people who, who think that, yeah, it makes sense to go, you know, yeah, there's more platinum in, one asteroid that's ever been mined on earth but you will spend more than the value of that platinum to try to go and extract that platinum from that asteroid and bring it back to earth so it's just right. not going to make sense financially but back to that idea of refueling spacecraft every kilogram of propellant that we have to carry off the earth is very expensive and if so if there was a way that we could extract this stuff from space for space then it is starting to make sense but. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think when it comes to things like like propellants, like if we could find an asteroid, um, you know, in, in a convenient location in a stable orbit that had, we think, a significant amount of water and we could, you know, build something there that we could learn how to use in order to, um, you know, convert that into fuel for passing spaceships, then, then that could be really helpful um, and would make us less we would use less fuel on earth to get things off the surface as you pointed out um would make spacecraft less heavy and it would make space travel in general easier um but i see that as like that i think is going to be fundamentally easier to accomplish or more feasible to accomplish than uh obtaining like rare metals yeah. and things like that yeah so i mean you're a geologist and planetary geologist you focus you happen to focus on asteroids but what are some some places in the solar system that you would love to be able to see some better data on some better some close-up images rover lander something to give you a really good view of what's going on there um that's always a fun question so um there are a handful of uh personal favorites that I have. One is one is another asteroid, then I'll get to the next Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, th um, you can include an asteroid if you want. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's a little on the nose, but sure. There is a um, there's an asteroid called Phaeton, which um, the Japanese Space Agency is actually developing a mission to go to. Um, and it goes like extremely close to the sun. We're talking inside the orbit of Mercury. So it gets really, really, really hot. And um, there's all kinds of materials that are being uh, ejected off the surface that go into this sort of stream of meteoroids that causes, you know, like, you know, we can see, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like falling stars on earth as we go through this meteoroid yeah. stream. And so for, for the specific research I do, like that's always been one of my favorites, but I'm also a huge fan of icy surfaces. Uh, and it's interesting, like Europa, for example, um, which we are sending um, the Europa Clipper mission is going to be an orbiter um, heading to Europa in the next handful of years. I don't know exactly what the launch date is these yeah. days, but um, but the surfaces of these icy bodies are really interesting because in space, where it's really cold, ice in some ways behaves a lot like rock. Wow. And so, like it, I want to go study the geology of these ice rocks as well and say like you know how are these rocks fracturing and, and how are yeah. they different from you know the surfaces that are that are just made of like regular rocks like we have yeah you know like we're used to here on earth um, Enceladus is also a moon that I study uh, for the same reason trying to understand like what are the properties of the ice and how do they behave mechanically how do they crack and break apart and and things like that um, yeah. we don't actively have a mission to go to Enceladus yet but there's a lot of interest um, because both Europa and Enceladus are of interest to people who study habitability, uh, because, uh, they have oceans under the ice. So. And I, I like, I know that it doesn't make sense to include a lander on the Europa Clipper. Like it makes sense to send the, send the orbiter, scan the moon in incredible detail, choose some great landing locations, figure out a mission that's going to be able to do the, do good work in that. 
but I really want to see from the surface of Europa, right? I just yeah. want to see that landscape. I want to see that horizon, see Jupiter overhead and see the, the, the shape of the ice. Is it smooth like a skating rink? Is it these, these jagged spears like they have in places on earth? Is it crumbly glacier like yeah. ice i just i really want to know what it looks like absolutely yeah. and and you i'm you know i'm sure you've seen the pictures of europa and the sort of really dramatic fractures that go across like, yeah. the ice yeah. shell you know huge you know moon crossing fractures uh, like imagine standing next to that you know and like what kind what kind of a grand canyon would it be yeah yeah is it thing? yeah is it Valles um, Marineris is it is it yeah. the grand canyon is it just like a little tiny dark is it like some kind of dark shape in the ice yeah. right yeah and and we really don't know yet um yeah so and there was talk of a lander for a while a separate mission that was going to be a lander um but i think for now we're just we're going to send clipper and hopefully um with the data that is collected from that yeah it'll be easier to send a landed mission in the future um you know other there's there's always practical considerations when it comes to like sharing the budget if you will too because you know i'm sure anybody watching this who works on like ice giants might be like okay but why don't we go to <laughs> neptune yeah. because we don't know anything about Neptune right. instead of sending a second. Yeah. Mission and to it's Europa. got, it's got Triton. That's a nice place to visit. Absolutely. It's got, it's got geysers. It's the whole it's package. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so there's a lot of, yeah. And then you learn about the gas giant and you have all of these like weird captured irregular icy bodies, you know, to kind of study yeah. that are orbiting it. And it's got rings. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, there's, we just we need infinite missions right? oh, okay to, yeah to kind of explain to explore everything in the solar system yeah yes please uh, <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome um, eventually yeah yeah um yeah i think th those are definitely the, like the top ones for me uh, you know in my dream i would be seeing from the surface of titan as well just to see the mm -hmm. you know that surface and, and same situation where you've got ice that's acting like rock turning into sand and and then you've got methane acting like rain flowing yeah. on it and forming rivers and forming into lakes and and things yeah. like that and 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 then on pluto everything is shifted again where the again the rock is is ice and the glaciers are like right. glaciers of frozen ammonia and methane and ices and stuff that shift around on the surface like it just right. must just be so bizarre to see that and yeah you know yeah you know what i always think about when somebody asks me this question too is um there are a lot of common ones that people will answer that are like their favorites you know titan europa these are all ones that kind of everybody who's kind of into space knows like these are really exciting places but we know that because we have images of it because we've been able to see yes. it like you know so we don't know what we don't know we don't know what we don't know so yeah. like so maybe we'll get to to triton uh or you know a, another you know random small moon that nobody talks about very much yeah. and maybe that will suddenly become the most interesting place yeah. that everybody wants to go yeah. and that's part of what's exciting about exploration right is yeah. is getting there and being like wow yeah. we had no idea that this could be so incredible and now we need to come back i think you know? iapetus for me is is like that that's just, a cool one. right and just yeah. to see this place that's half in half dark and half light and to think of the process that that happened to to, you know, to see that up close and actually be standing on the edge to see how one side of it got uh, got painted it would be incredible um yeah we're, we're running out of time i've got one last question that just that just came in i want to fire this to you what is the likelihood this comes from cullen wright what is the likelihood of interstellar or intergalactic objects such as an asteroid becoming gravitationally bound to a body in our solar system and i guess would you recognize an interstellar object if you were able to look at it up close, do you think? Um, I don't know that up, looking at it up close would give you that information. Um, so I am not a dynamicist. People who work, who, who work to understand the dynamics of orbits of objects are really 
who should be answering this question, but I think I think it comes down to looking at uh, where is it coming from and where is it going to? And the longer we can kind of track its orbit um, as it's coming through the solar system, the easier it is for us to determine like, wow, that's moving way too fast for it to have come yeah. from yeah. the main belt. So it must be coming from farther away, for example, or the angle, yeah. you know, that yeah. it is sort of to the plane of the solar system. Um, so that type of work really requires like monitoring their orbits and doing modeling of, you know, like modeling of, of the energy involved in, in the gravitation, you know, the gravity of its orbit and, and its interaction with the sun and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Um, it would be, again, a, another thing that would be amazing to look at just to know that this thing formed in another solar system and then you could do that differential analysis and just say like what's the same what's different like right. literally the universe the milky way is throwing science data our way and right. we just have to be able to catch it well we've got yeah. a time uh dr malaro thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today congratulations on on all of your research if people want to follow you and see what you're up to where should they go uh, so I'm very active on Twitter. My username is Space Jammy, J-A-M-M-I-E. Okay, well, I, I think um, I already put a link in the show notes, but we'll definitely do that. Okay, yeah, so I'm there. Um, there's a link in my Twitter bio if you want to check out my website for me and my research or other kinds of projects I've been working on. So Fantastic. that's the best place to hit me up. All right, well, again, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, and again, good luck on getting the samples back into your hands. You can study them up close. I can't yeah, wait. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. All right, take care.